Thank you all so much for getting the channel to 300 subscribers. I want to do a special 300 sub video, so please comment your ideas below. Thanks again, and please enjoy the video. Snake charming is a well-known practice in many Asian and North African countries. It is the art of making a snake bend to your musical charm, taking a venomous animal and putting it into a trance. In this video, we talk about the practice of snake charming. How did it come to be? How does it actually work? And if it's still common today? The practice of snake charming is believed to have been originated in ancient Egypt. However, the type of snake charming most of us know originated in what is today India. Snake charming is the act of making a snake rise out of a container to the sound of a wind instrument known as a pungi. As the charmer plays the pungi, the snake enters a trance, going from potentially deadly to practically harmless. However, is this actually the case? Kinda? While the charmer is making the snake rise up and the pungi is playing a key role in the process, it's not the sound of the pungi that's making the snake behave the way it is. Rather, it's the waving motion that the charmer uses. While snakes can pick up vibrations, they do not have outer ears. Therefore, they cannot hear the music coming from the pungi. What? What they are reacting to is the waving motion the charmer does with the pungi. The snake, usually a cobra of some sort, sees this waving motion as a threat, which is why it rises up and locks onto it. What the charmer is doing is basically just aggravating the snake. Now, is the charmer in any danger? Well, that depends. Snake charming is usually passed down from generation to generation, and prospective snake charmers usually apprentice first before going out on their own. As for the snake itself, it depends on the region. In North Africa, the snake's mouth is usually closed where only the tongue can stick out. This is because some people in North Africa believe that the snake's venom is located in the tongue, so having its tongue still exposed keeps that veil of danger. This practice often leads to the snake dying from starvation or infection. In India, mouth binding is done as well, but it's also common to see snakes defanged with their venom glands incapacitated. To additionally lower the risk, the snakes are often intentionally dehydrated. This makes them sluggish and easier to deal with during a performance. All of these methods have led to the practice being relatively shunned in modern times. Even in India, where the practice is said to have become popular, it is today banned, having been banned in 1972 as part of a Wildlife Protection Act. This doesn't mean snake charming isn't still practiced. In fact, in many lesser populated regions of India, you can still find snake charmers. However, it is next to impossible to make a living solely off of snake charming today. Many snake charmers live in relative squalor, relying on selling goods and practicing as healers in order to get by. These bans had a split effect. While they helped to protect the snakes, they also crippled a centuries-old cultural tradition. This led to a variety of protests, with a group of snake charmers gathering at the temple of Charkidadri in 2003, and even more storming the legislator of Odisha in 2004 to voice their concerns. It has been proposed that a modification could be made to the laws to benefit both the snakes and the snake charmers. Many suggest having charmers trained to be proper snake handlers that can go in and remove venomous snakes from areas. There are many snake charmers that already do this on the side. Others propose that the charmers can remove the snake element altogether and become street musicians, utilizing their pungis. Either way, this is still a debated topic in India and other countries where snake charming is performed. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, take care.